Hello and welcome. I'm Yi Ying Chen from the Free and Secular Gallery, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. Since spring is in the air, today we are going to transport you to one of the most beloved space um, at the Free Air Gallery, the Free Air Courtyard. And the session today will uh, start with a meditation practice led by Upana Sadananda. And then we'll be followed by a spotlight talk by Victor Bonilla. He is a docent at the Free Air Sector since 2015. And thank you again for joining us. And without further ado, Apana, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Yining. Namaste, everybody. Namaste, Victor. Welcome to yet another art inspired meditation. Friends, we've always traveled through space and time with all the art inspirations that we've meditated to in the past several weeks. Today uh, and last week, we actually traveled to experience meditatively a spring landscape, visualizing being under the shade of the different kinds of trees in springtime. But today, we'd like to take you outdoors, but to our own beloved museum space and meditate on the freer courtyard. So let me start by sharing a, a picture of the Freer Courtyard, the garden there. And, uh, and then I will share more about how our practice will be today, what we'll, we'll actually be doing in the practice. So here we are. And this is the picture of the Freer Courtyard that we're going to be meditating to. Now, this is just a first glance. I invite you to take this time to set up your device screens. So when we're meditating, there will be parts where we may look away or close our eyes. And then when we open our eyes, if the screen is set in a way that it's easy to see, then that would be perfect. And besides that, another thing you may want to check is uh, your audio settings. Please make sure that you can hear me clearly. You can always take some extra time. Make sure that uh, we can all hear the guidance clearly. And yes, we will be going into the slideshow. Uh, but just for now, I'm going to pause the screen share and tell you a little bit more about what our meditation will be. So today's meditation is about the five elements, air, space, water, ether, and fire. So we're going to meditate on these elements and we'll be practicing a hand gesture or a mudra that I'll tell you about. So the first five minutes of our meditation will center our attention. Then for about 10 to 15 minutes, we'll examine the um, the courtyard, the different elements, architectural elements of the courtyard. And then we'll practice a meditation of the five elements, visualizing the presence of these elements within our own body. All right. So towards that end, I invite you to find a comfortable seated position, find a tall spine, and then just warm up your hands. We're having a slightly chilly day here in the DC, Virginia area. So might be a good idea to warm up our hands. And this hand gesture is called the Dharma Pravartana Mudra. Basically, it means it translates to that which sets the Dharma uh, into action. We'll go into the details later. But to do this mudra, you want to join the tips of all of your fingers. And then in the thumbs, line them up along the edges. So it's as if you're enclosing a small globe inside your hands. And then while practicing, we'll relax the shoulders and hold the hands just below the sternum, like, like there. A few inches above the navel. All right? So take your time. Practice the mudra. And if you feel that you need to warm up a little bit more, maybe roll your shoulders. Do whatever you need to, to find alignment, tall spine. And whenever you're ready, 
come back to holding the mudra. We'll take about 30 seconds to settle down. Just get, just get comfortable with holding the hand gesture. As you bring the mudra to the solar plexus, you want the elbows to hug towards the body. Head in line with the spine. All right. Let's relax our hands. We'll come back to this later in our practice. So whenever I cue you to practice the Dharma Pravartana Mudra or the hand mudra, please find this posture for your hands. Now let's send to our attention. So maybe close your eyes. Maybe lower your gaze. And slowly, from wherever your attention might be, invite your attention to how the body is supported in space. Where do you notice the body touching the chair or the floor? And if you can relax at these points of contact, receive more support. Do that. And slowly from there, let your attention evolve to the whole body. Now you might not necessarily be in contact with something very solid. We can think of this as an interface with the elements of space and air. maybe even visualizing the whole body and the context of that space we're meditating from. Now coming back to the body, let's take a few deep mindful breaths. Inhale through the nose. Maybe exhale through the mouth. Inhaling through the nose. Exhaling as a way of letting go. Allowing ourselves that permission to slow down. We shift from the autopilot to living a little more in the present moment. Notice the breath flowing into the body as the energy of life. Notice the breath becoming the different forms of energy that allow this body to function. Notice the entire body as a container to hold life itself. Now let's bring awareness to different parts of the body. As I mentioned, a part of the body, we'll bring our attention there and observe whatever sensations are. Let's start by bringing attention to the feet. You couldn't see or move the feet. 
How can we know of the feet's presence through these sensations? And then slowly, let's mirror this process on to the shins and the caps. Knees and the thighs. The hips and the feet. The back. The front of the torso. The neck and the head. arms, the hands, the whole body, all of the sensations in the whole body. If that's too much for your attention, just focus on one prominent sensation, noticing where it is and what it is. And when we have allowed our attention to inhabit the body so intimately, when we feel a significant improvement in the quality of embodiment, maybe gently open the eyes. So we may gaze at this picture of the freer courtyard and the garden there. For some time, let's just observe whatever draws our attention to itself. And then let's all converge our attention to that central space occupied by a fountain. Water rising up from the fountain. And then that water flowing down and raining down from the base of that, to the bowl like space of that fountain into the pool, the circular pool that surrounds it. You could imagine yourself to be standing there on a hot summer afternoon, brightly lit up. And just ponder over the effect of that sound of water, creating a sense of balance between heat and cold in our own inner experience. And then as we slowly move our gaze to the floor that surrounds the fountain, we can allow our eyes to be soothed by the green of the hedge. small fluffs of boxwood, like pom-poms decorating, framing the fountain. And as I continue to examine the floor, you might see a circular pattern with radial lines. As if those are symbolic of the reflection of the sun 
probably must be shining right above the courtyard. Notice the are the terracotta colors of the bricks. And all of that framed by an almost square shaped face, square shaped boundary. with steps on the left and the right side. And at least from this picture, we can guess that the courtyard, the, the logia surrounding the courtyard, open up to the courtyard from two sides, from the left and the right. Notice the trees and their colors. The placement of those huge pots marking the boundaries of the stair on either side. arches and the columns. And as we look a little closer, the wall that's facing, that we would be facing if we're standing like we are seated right now, from that viewpoint, also see the reflections in the mirrors. And in the space that it encloses, what is the sense of symmetry we get? Whether it's the symmetry of the elements, the architectural elements, whether it's the symmetry in the placement of trees and objects. But placing ourselves in the center of the space, be symbolic of finding that inner harmony that we're invited to as we enter the museum. Notice how there's a continuity with the outdoors in the form of an open space, this being a courtyard, it just opens up to the elements of ether and space. And although it looks like very still at this point, but maybe in the dropping of the water drops here in the fountain, you could get a sense of how the breeze would be, a gentle breeze deflecting these drops of water. Let's spend a quiet minute here, just taking in the details.
And that is complete. I invite you to hold the Dharma Pravartana Mudra. And if you missed it at the beginning of our meditation, please join the tips of your fingers and then align your thumbs through their edges. Hold your hands as if you're holding a globe in between and bring your hands to the level of the solar plexus. We'll take a few breaths here. Noticing how this mudra naturally allows us to breathe easy by helping us sit tall. What are the sensations and qualities you notice as you hold up this posture and this hand gesture? Now maybe continuing to hold the mudra, we could open our eyes and notice how the element of earth is represented in this picture of the courtyard. Where do we see the qualities of support, stability, solidity? Where do we notice that in the body? Here we could bring attention to the points of contact, the bones, the connective tissues, all of which form the matrix, the scaffold for the body. That is complete. Allowing the body to relax into these foundational supports. Let's invite our eyes to observe the element of water in this picture. Noticing the ease with which the water in the fountain is being sprayed up. The water is allowing itself to be sprayed up and rise. And then with the same ease, it's flowing down. Why do we notice that element of water in our body? How can we symbolically cultivate the qualities of ease and fluidity to go with the flow, to be on a path of least resistance? Can we allow the breath to be easy? In all of these ways, embodying the qualities of water within. And that is complete. We'd open our eyes to notice the element of fire represented as light and heat in the symbol of the sun. Why 
Why do we observe these qualities of the fire elements in the body? We take some time to meditate upon the transformative quality of fire. The ability of the body to transform the breath into so many ways, so many forms. That is complete. Bring awareness to the element of air. As we might observe it in this picture and then in the body itself. This could be our invitation to take deep breaths, honoring the air. It brings in oxygen in life. And when that is complete, let us invite our eyes to observe the qualities of space. The space of nothingness and potential in this picture. Then within the body, within the mind. And then let's bring awareness to all of these five elements, the Pancha Mahabhutas, space, air, fire, water, and earth. All of these enclosed by the boundaries of the courtyard. Just like the body enclosing the qualities of all these five elements within it. And our hand gesture, Dharma Pravartana Mudra, a reminder symbolic of enclosing all the five elements within. Let us spend a minute in contemplation and in silence. And we begin to feel a sense of connection of the elements within this body, the elements outside. Slowly relax our hands, knees or thighs. Then bringing palms together in prayer. Let us close our practice by taking the time to offer the self a namaste honoring all the five elements within us. Praying that body and body which is made of all these elements be purified through this practice. May that allow us to live in harmony within and outside.
Namaste to all the forces of the universe that facilitated our being here now and together. Namaste to the architect and the people who constructed this space. And also namaste to all the teachers of yoga meditation, keeping this tradition and wisdom alive through their teachings. Maybe close, offering each other a namaste as a way of saying the light in me honors the light in you. And thank you all so very much for joining me in this meditation and inward journey to the freer courtyard. I hope, like me, some of you who have probably meditated there in the past in the logia surrounding the courtyard set an intention to be there again soon. Thank you so much for being with me today. And if you have any questions about the Mudravi practice or anything related to yoga, please feel free to post it to the chat. Namaste and peace be to all. Now it's over to you, Yingying. Thank you, Rabama. Thank you for the lovely uh, practice. And now uh, let's demo about the free Korea with, with Victor, the digital florist, yours, Victor. Namaste, Aparna. Thank you. And thank you, Yin Yang. Uh, let's go to the first slide. And here we have a view of the exterior facing north onto the National Mall. And as um, you might know, Charles Lang Freer, uh, in which the courtyard is, uh, visited Italy at the end of the 19th century with Charles Platt, his architect. Uh, for the future museum, and himself a renowned uh, landscape architect, designer. And they came to appreciate the architecture for which the Italian peninsula had been renowned through time. Next slide, please. Freer's trips included the Mediterranean island of Capri, which he first visited in 1894. His enchantment was such that he even bought the Villa Castello together with a fellow Michigander, Thomas Spencer Jerome in 1900. Next slide. Freer's exposure to many fine examples of Italian building styles influenced his eventual selection of what is referred to as the Renaissance Palazzo style. A palazzo is the Italian uh, word derived from the Latin of palatium from whence the English word palace comes from. The first known use of that term palazzo was in 1657. Freer loved its symmetry, the proportion, the texture, the light, and often a center courtyard that provided light to the interior rooms. Here we have a classic example of that style called the Palazzo del Seminario in Lecce, Italy. Next slide. But here's my take. A proper derivation must acknowledge earlier models based on the Roman Mediterranean architectural style. And there are two distinct sources that serve different functions. The first one is the Roman domus or the urban house. As you will notice in this example from Pompeii, the facade gives onto the street is blank with no windows and therefore no exposure to the bustle and noise of the city streets. Attention is entirely focused on the interior of the house, as it were, far from the maddening crowd. Next slide. To alleviate any sense of being enclosed in these houses, architectural elements were used like the impluvium we see depicted here, an open courtyard with a pool to gather rain and also admit the light, which uh, in some wealthier homes also included a garden complete with a fountain or pool Often we use, uh, we find the use of bright and profuse fresco paintings throughout um, the house, depicting full landscapes to fool the mind into imagining broad vistas in the midst of what is an obvious urban setting. Next slide. The other source we might consider for the freer is the Roman villa. It was a large country house which employed several structures or outlying buildings arranged around the courtyard you can see here. And what was essential was, of course, complete with a fountain or pool. 
Often uh, you'd also see in the upper classes this kind of villa, but in later times they contained working farms. And we can see an example in the next uh, slide coming up after this one. Uh, in the later Middle Ages, they would become models for the monasteries, in particular what are referred to as cloisters around a garden, often planted with medicinal herbs and other vegetation. You will notice that the fountain is set in the pool in the center of the garden, and there's a wide enclosed courtyard, or which is more prominent here. A covered walkway, the forerunner of the loggia we shall view later at the freer, keeps the sun and elements at bay, while providing protected passage to the adjoining rooms. Next slide. And here you can see, as we saw with a purna that she used in the meditation, a clear example of freer and uh, plat borrowing that. Next slide. Now let's take a bird's eye view of the freer gallery. It measures 228 by 185 feet. It's self-contained and turns inward to its 65 foot square courtyard. It was built at a time when technology allowed for interior climate and light control. Nevertheless, the basic arrangement resembles the airy open villa style best suited to the Mediterranean climate. Its exterior is primarily constructed of gray granite quarried in Milford, Massachusetts. The gallery's interior walls are Indiana limestone and the floors are polished Tennessee marble. Platt's horizontal massing, what you see here, is designed in the outward style of an Italian Renaissance palace we saw earlier. But there, resemblances end. Unlike the palazzo, it is only one story, and here we see that the facade is windowless, like the Roman domus of Pompeii. The main front on the mall is a rusticated five-part composition with a triple arched entry in the center, which is repeated in the entrance reception hall, leading straight out to the central courtyard. Next slide, please. The changing seasons and light transform the courtyard throughout the year. The boxwood hedges surround the fountain and parts of the garden to give a formal appearance complementing the serene and calm atmosphere that Freer intended to foster when viewing his collection. And in fact, the Japanese red maples you see are a reminder that Freer's collection reflects his sense of beauty as transcending time and cultures, East and West. Next slide. Every season has its image reflected in the courtyard. Next slide. Let me show you how they incorporated well, I guess I won't be able to do it with my pointer, but anyway, um, how they incorporated the classical Roman architecture in our courtyard. They have the loggias you see here, covered walkways with groin vault ceilings, a carnelian granite fountain, the pools, the vegetation garden, seating, which normally you would see, <laughs> and sometimes tables along the uh, walkways or the, um, the loggia. The walls themselves are of unpolished Tennessee white marble. Cornices and friezes, a balustrade with finials, which you can see here, are all in beautiful proportion. The metope, sculpture of amphorae and rosettes, are classical symbols of fortune. Fluted pilasters frame the arches with Doric capitals and lanterns hang from the groined arch ceilings. Next slide, please. All four facades with stairs in the middle allow the visitors to flow into the courtyard. Three sides of the courtyard have open loggias. When one is sitting in the loggias, an intimate view of a recessed courtyard adds to the viewer's pleasure. Next, please. When Freer learned his collection was accepted by the Smithsonian as the first art museum on the National Mall, he undertook to round out his gift of 19th and 20th century American art with artists like John Singer Sargent, 1856-1925, whose charming depiction of an Italian loggia reminded him of his own courtyard design. In 1894, Freer had gone to Italy to visit the villas and gardens recommended by his friend Platt. 
The trip may have influenced his decision to buy this painting in 1917. Entitled Breakfast in the Loggia, it represents the Villa Torregali at Scandici on the outskirts of Florence, where Sargent stayed with a party of friends during, during the autumn of 1910. And I can tell you more about what the scene portrays, if you like, in the Q's and A's. Next slide, please. And finally, the gala is often featured in the courtyard on these special occasions at night in which you would have the opportunity to experience a magical moment. Thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Victor. And thank you for sharing this with us. And it's really make me miss our the free Koya a lot. I remember for some of our like Friday night events or some of our special event, we have tea ceremony like in the Korea and it's it was really special. So we do have a question coming in the chat and it's about um, what's the connection of the sound of the architecture style you shown you show us earlier and Spanish ar architecture. Do you know uh, anything about this? Mm. Well, I hadn't uh, done research on that, but from my experience living in Spain and, and looking at some of it, uh, yes, it's a derivative because don't forget that under the, um, the Habsburgs that um, ruled Spain for uh, practically 300 years or less, a little less, uh, they brought in influences from Southern uh, Italy uh, because the uh, Habsburg monarch was also the king of uh, Sicily and the kingdoms, uh, the two kingdoms. So even things like um, a curious little example um, would be the, um, the famous creches for Christmas uh, that are famous in Spain now and their Spaniards love them. If you go there in Christmas time, which I recommend in the little villages, you will find these incredible displays of creches, you know, the nativity scene. Anyway, that came from Italy too. So yes, it's very much, um, in fact, um, the Spanish kings had um, Italian architects at their court. So yes, it's it's very much derivative. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Um, uh, uh, so we also have a participants um, and um, curious about like uh, is there so are there any asian design elements uh in the courtyard other than the japanese maple tree unfortunately not that i know of <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know th the whole point i think that freer was trying to express here was his own aesthetic and his own aesthetic as you know he started his uh collections not with asian art but with uh, 19th century American artists. Um, and so people like doing, and of course, when he um, uh, started collecting um, Whistler's uh, drawings and then actually met him in London at his studio, Whistler turned him on to Asian art. So it's really through James McNeil Whistler that uh, Freer became involved and eventually built one of the finest collections bar none in the United States, one of the earliest ones. So, um, you know, the, the, the initial uh, donation of 8,000 uh, pieces he gave to the Freer, which were later complemented with another 18,000 to our collection, uh, really come from Freer's idea that it doesn't matter what part of the globe you're from, there is a concept of beauty that it's innate in all humans and that we're able to appreciate it regardless of whether it was ancient Egypt, uh, the court at Kyoto in the uh, you know 12th century, or modern day 19th century uh, New York City and a John Singer Sargent uh, loggia painting. So yeah, it's it's his bringing together, mm -hmm. and I think and I think Aparna did a wonderful job. Thank you again of bringing the idea of the restfulness. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people come to the freer to sort of meditate. I know my first involvement years ago with the Freer was to meditate. If you go across the mall to the American History Museum, where I'm also a docent, uh, you get millions of people there a year, and it's a hustle and bustle, kids running around. But in the Freer and the Sackler, you really, not only do you go to con contemplate, but appreciate the contemplative beauty of what's on display. And I think that's what Freer really wanted. 
So, so I, I guess it's almost, I mean, it's already past 12.45. So thank you, Victor, for sharing your knowledge with us. And also, if Apana, I saw there's a question about the moon draw, but is there any significance? So if you would like to conclude the session with that, it will be wonderful. So thank you, Paul. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Absolutely, uh, Yin Yang. Um, yeah, I will. I would like to offer a very brief response to that question for today. But uh, if you're really curious, please do come back on Monday. We can continue that conversation after our meditation on Monday. Um, first of all, I want to thank Victor for such a wonderful um, spotlight, and uh, thank you for taking us uh, into like so much of information with so much ease, just like the flow of water. Thank you. Um, and, and that was only uh, half of what I had. <laughs> <laughs> we need to do this again then. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Victor. And, Thank you. Uh, and a quick uh, response to the question about Dharma Pravartana Mudra uh, is that it is inspired by a practice in yoga, which is called the Bhuta Shuddhi. Now, if you remember, some of my past meditation presentations would have shared that in Tantra Yoga, we see the body as a microcosmic representation of the macrocosm. So one of the ways in which we could relate to what is outside is by exploring its manifestation inside. And the body is made of the elements, the five elements. So uh, the Bhuta Shuddhi practice in yoga is about purifying these five elements within the body very specifically a practice of kundalini yoga, which talks about the awakening of the energy, which is thought to be coiled and dormant in the base of the spine. So as we allow that energy to rise, it leads us to this uh, sort of an enlightenment um, experience. And the Dharma Pravartana Mudra is a mudra that facilitates that process of Bhuta Shuddhi. So when we do the whole meditation, it's much more detailed than what we practice today. It talks about, uh, so we just practice the element meditation. But when we do the Bhuta Shuddhi with the Dharma Pravartana Mudra, it's about visualizing the root chakra as the uh, embodiment of earth, and then each of the chakras upwards as one of the elements and so on. We'll practice that on Monday when we exclusively do just a meditation. So more on that on Monday, and hopefully you can join us again. Well, thank you so much for being here. Namaste. Peace be to all.